Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. Uh, today for general biology lecture, I'm going to start discussing transcription and translation. First we're going to start with transcription or changing the genetic code, the DNA code, into a readable RNA code. Okay? And so the process is shown here, all transcription and translation is both shown here, and that is that you have DNA in the case of humans, we have 46 chromosomes, 3 billion base pairs. <clears throat> well, some of that DNA codes for proteins, okay? and that's called genes. Well, so certain regions on your chromosome are going to have certain genes, and those regions that hold the genes are called loci, and those genes can be transcribed. And so what you see here is the DNA opening up. It'll open up at the gene level, so a certain sequence or uh, region of the DNA is going to open up, and then RNA polymerase will come in and make an RNA strand, an RNA copy of the DNA. Okay. That RNA copy is then uh, cut up and, and introns are removed and exons are spliced together <clears throat> with spliceosome and we'll get to this material in a little bit okay, to form a messenger RNA strand. That messenger RNA strand then leaves the nucleus. So here you can see in this light pink color is the nucleus okay, and the messenger RNA will leave the nucleus. This, what's going on in here is called transcription that messenger RNA is then utilized to link amino acids together to form a protein. That is translation. Okay. And so we're going to spend some time the next few lectures going through transcription and translation and then how is this process regulated. All right. <clears throat> so first off, this process is sometimes just called the central dogma theory. Okay. And that is that DNA is transcribed into RNA and then translated into proteins. So sometimes you'll hear people say um, that they reverse the central dogma theory. So that means that they took a protein and they reversed it. They changed it into the amino acid code um, or the RNA code for that amino acids that are linked together to make that protein. Then they took that RNA code and they reversed it back to DNA. <clears throat> now, originally we used to do this when we didn't have very good methods of DNA analysis. And we still kind of do this in some situations because it's quick. Um, you can take, if you already know the protein structure and the amino acids that are linked together and um, the order of amino acids, then you can reverse it and get a rough estimate of what the DNA should be for that protein. Okay, <clears throat> so one thing that I have to make sure that you understand is that DNA is <clears throat> a universal information storage molecule. Okay? And so information is stored as DNA, okay? but it is not utilized until it's been rewritten into RNA. Okay? And so once it's rewritten into RNA, then it can be translated into proteins. So DNA is very useful for storing information, but it's much like if you're talking about, you know, um, building, let's say you're building a toy, okay? and or putting together something, and the instructions are in Spanish. Okay? but you don't really know Spanish. Um, so you might translate the instructions into English. So you're going to translate it from DNA into a different language. Okay? And then you're going to put all the pieces together in the right order to form a certain protein. So you can think of it kind of like that. And if you're a guy, then you just try to build the protein and it never works. But regardless, okay? um, the way the central dogma theory works is DNA has to be transcribed into RNA and then translated into proteins. 
So transcription is the formation of what we call messenger RNA. Okay? And that is made from a gene within DNA. Okay? So remember, you have 25,000 genes. These genes are coding for proteins. Okay? But they code for proteins in kind of a roundabout way. They actually code for messenger RNA strands. And then the messenger RNA strand is utilized to make the protein. That formation of the protein is what we call translation. So you're using the blueprints of your messenger RNA to link together amino acids in the correct order. Okay? Once the amino acids are linked into the correct order, then the amino acids are broken free and they can do what proteins do. They can twist, they can fold over, they can go from a primary protein all the way to a quaternary protein by just binding and wrapping and, and uh, you know, uh, doing protein-to-protein -protein interaction. And we already talked about that before. All right, so let's go into transcription. <clears throat> like I said before, your chromosomes contain roughly 25,000 genes. But on your chromosome, not all pieces of the DNA is a G. Okay? There are placeholders, and so there's chunks of your chromosome that do nothing but hold the place of genes. So they separate genes from each other. <clears throat> Those genes that occur on your chromosome, about every chromosome has roughly a thousand genes or so. Okay? We have 23 chromosomes and 25,000 genes, so it's about a thousand per chromosome, give or take a few hundred in certain situations. Those genes are going to code for proteins. Okay? And it codes actually for the amino acid sequence for that protein. Okay? Like I said before, DNA is a good storage molecule. Okay? It's double-stranded, it's often associated with proteins. It's nearly always associated with RNA. Okay. It's housed in its own membrane, okay. separate from the rest of the cell and the nucleus for eukaryotes in um, the nucleoid region for prokaryotes. Okay. And it's, it's well protected. It's not likely to unravel on its own. It can withstand high temperatures and cold temperatures. So it makes it a very useful molecule for storing information. Okay? And it never leaves the nucleus if there's a nucleus present. Okay? In the case of prokaryotes, there's no nucleus, so it just stays in the nucleoid region. Okay? And like I said before, DNA is copied into RNA. Okay? And so <clears throat> the information for how to construct a protein is embedded in DNA in the form of genes, okay? but it has to be translated, or tra sorry, transcribed, rewritten into RNA. Now, there are lots of ways in which this can occur, in which mistakes can be made, um, things like that. Uh, other organisms can take advantage of this process by which we go about building new proteins. They can get their DNA inserted into our genome. And so viruses will do this. Okay? Um, sometimes, you know, Pathogens can do this, or pathogens can at least take advantage of this process. Um, viruses are always going to insert their DNA into the, the DNA of a host cell. Normally this is in the form of bacteria, but sometimes it's in the form of prokaryotes. Okay. And so <clears throat> this message itself has to be protected. It's protected in the nucleus. The gene is copied inside the nucleus, and then it leaves the nuclear envelope and encounters ribosomes 
in the cytoplasm or associated with the endoplasmic reticulum in order to form proteins. So here you can see it. Uh, this is just, just like the opening picture, just a little more zoomed in. Your DNA resides inside your nucleus, in our case, 3 billion base pairs, okay, on 46 chromosomes, 23 different chromosomes, okay, and roughly 25,000 genes. One of those genes, let's say we're um, in need of lactase, okay, that enzyme, that protein. So what is triggered is the messenger RNA is triggered to be made for lactase, and often this will already be in solution. So this doesn't always transcription doesn't always have to happen. And when you need to make a new protein, sometimes the messenger RNA is just floating around in the cytoplasm. But let's say for argument purposes, the messenger RNA is not floating out here in the cytoplasm for lactase, but rather we have a trigger okay, that we have a lot of lactose in our diet and we need to form more enzyme, last lactase. We need to get the sugar from that lactose and break it down and get the energy. So the DNA becomes transcribed just for the gene that codes for lactase. That makes a messenger RNA strand. That messenger RNA strand would have the information needed to link together the amino acids in order to form the protein lactase. That messenger RNA leaves the nuclear envelope through the nuclear pore. Okay? It encounters ribosomes in the cytoplasm or if there's you know a endoplasmic reticulum okay, that has ribosomes associated with it, it'll encounter the ribosomes there. Okay? And then it lays down the amino acid in this specific order dictated by the messenger RNA strand then those amino acids can fold and, and, and twist and things like that to form the protein. In this case, if we're forming lactase, to form the protein lactase. Okay, <clears throat> just like when we were talking about DNA copying itself, okay, we talked about DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is a enzyme that lays down new nucleotides of DNA. Well, when we're talking about transcription, we don't want DNA to be laid down. We want RNA to be laid down. So RNA polymerase is an enzyme that lays down new nucleotides of RNA. And so it's going to lay down the, um, the matching pair to the DNA. So you're going to transcribe the DNA to messenger RNA. It's done so very similar to when we're talking about DNA synthesis. You first need to be able to bind uh, polymerase to the DNA strand. In the case of synthesis, remember that was binding due to an RNA primer. We don't need an RNA primer when we're talking about transcription because RNA polymerase doesn't need a primer, but it does need what we call a promoter region. Okay? This is a region on the DNA that allows for RNA polymerase to bind to it. Okay? And then after that region would be the gene that we're interested in. Okay? This would include the introns and the exons, but we're only interested in the exons, so the introns will be removed. But at any rate, that promoter will give RNA polymerase a binding spot and allow it to make a complementary copy of the DNA strand. Remember to figure out whether or not we're dealing with RNA or DNA. In an RNA strand you will see uracil. Right? In a DNA stand, strand you would see thymine. Right? That's the main difference when we're you know pairing up nucleotides um, that's the main difference that you're going to see. Now, again, the sugar's different also. Okay? But when we write it out, we're not writing out that the sugar is a little bit different. Okay? In this case, you know, we're concentrating on just the nitrogenous base difference between the two. Okay, so here you can see you're going to have this promoter region, okay? which <clears throat> is going to allow for 
the strands to open up and allow for RNA polymerase to bind to the DNA molecule. When it binds to the DNA molecule, just like DNA synthesis, a new molecule can only be formed in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. So you can only add new nucleotides regardless of whether they're DNA nucleotides or RNA nucleotides. You can only add nucleotides to the 3' prime end of a growing strand. Okay. Eventually, you're going to reach a portion of the strand which we call a stop codon okay, and or we're going to reach a portion of this strand where we're going to reach a termination code okay, that disassociates the RNA polymerase so the RNA polymerase will fall off and your strand will be made your messenger RNA strand for that gene for whatever protein we're coding for is going to be made right? and then it can disassociate and leave and go into solution okay so let's look at kind of a video describing this transcription in um, well both eukaryotes and prokaryotes is a little bit different between the two because again eukaryotes have a nuclei and prokaryotes don't but the premise the idea behind the two is fairly similar um, and we'll talk about the differences between the two as we progress. The synthesis of messenger RNA is called transcription. Transcription begins when RNA polymerase recognizes and binds to the promoter region on the double-stranded DNA molecule. A particular subunit of the messenger RNA called the sigma factor participates in recognition of the promoter region. Soon after transcription is initiated, the sigma factor dissociates from the RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase moves along the template strand of the DNA, synthesizing the complementary single-stranded messenger RNA molecule. Synthesis is in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, with new nucleotides being added to the 3' prime end of the growing messenger RNA molecule. As the RNA polymerase advances along the DNA, it melts a new stretch of DNA and allows the previous stretch to close. When RNA polymerase reaches a specific sequence of nucleotides on the DNA called the transcription terminator, a hairpin loop structure forms in the messenger RNA, causing the RNA polymerase and the messenger RNA to dissociate from the DNA. Okay, so there you can see how uh, messenger RNA is formed. Now that promoter region, it depends on the group of organisms that we talk about, but a lot of times this will be a region where you might have an attached lac operin, or, or this is a region which we call the TATA -ta box, a T-A-T-A -T -A repeat, and that is just the region at which the sigma factor can associate okay a gene is to follow okay and it starts to copy that region all right <clears throat> so when we go from transcription we need to go into translation and so i'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about translating okay and then we'll go into a much greater detail about translation okay so <clears throat> the messenger RNA has been made okay, and it's made off of the DNA, off the gene. Okay. Then that messenger RNA has to be translated into amino acid chains. Okay, so like I said before, DNA is great for carrying information but it's not great for being able to translate that information. You have to rewrite the gene. Right. Um, the way at which we translate, at least the way at which we see all organisms on this planet translating their DNA, is by what we call a genetic code or a codon. Okay? And that is that three nucleotides are read 
as a single reading frame. Okay, so you take your messenger RNA strand, and every three nucleotides is what we call a codon. Okay, so every three nucleotides is associating with a single amino acid. So when the messenger RNA is read, it's read three nucleotides at a time, or what we often call one codon at a time. <clears throat> okay, and like I said before, each codon or each three nucleotides are associated with a particular amino acid. Now, we talked a little bit about Francis Crick before, and we talked about his work, but he was in part the reason for the discovery of codons, or in the case of this, which codons or how many nucleotides make up a codon. And so this was really kind of a trial and error, but it's more like mathematics. Um, if you were to look at what a codon could be, we know that there are four nucleotides. And so if each nucleotide coded for a certain amino acid, then we know that there was only four amino acids. But in actuality, we know that there are actually 20 amino acids. And we already discovered 20 amino acids, so we know that one nucleotide is not what makes up a codon. Two nucleotides would mean that, based on that, we would have 16 different codes, okay? or 16 different amino acids. Okay? This wasn't enough. Okay? So through trial and error experiments, we suggested, well, if there's three nucleotides per codon, per amino acid, then that would mean that you have 64 possible combinations for the 20 amino acids that we know. And that's how we figured out that, indeed, there are three nucleotides per codon because that's enough to cover the 20 amino acids that we know. Now here's the crazy part about amino acids and about this system is this system is universal. Every single organism uses the exact same system and they use the exact same three codons for or three nucleotides for each codon and their codons are the same. So when we look at, you know, whether or not you're going to lay down the amino acid methanin okay, with the codon AUG, so adenine, uracil, guanine, codes for methanin in humans. Well, it also codes for methanin in chimpanzees, gorillas, giraffes, okay, a rainbow trout, a pine tree, it codes for methanin and bacteria, everything, everything on the planet, same codes. Okay, so this is very unique and was, uh, you know, of great interest and still is of great interest to biologists. So here you can see there are 20 amino acids and there are 64 codons. What that means is a lot of the amino acids are coded for by multiple codons. Okay? So in this case, leucine okay, is coded for by five, six, sorry, six different codons. Okay? Now the codons are really similar, especially this codon. CU anything will give you leucine. So CUU, CUC, CUA, CUG, leucine. Okay? That amino acid. So that makes it a lot of wiggle room on what that last nucleotide is, it doesn't matter, it's still giving a leucine. Okay? Now there are some that are very specific. Okay? And like I said, methanin okay, is also known as the start codon. Methanin will always start every protein. Okay? So the first amino acid laid down is methanin, AUG. Okay. Then there are three codons which do not code for amino acids. Instead, they stop the amino acid chain. Okay. 
That's UAA, UAG, and UGA. Okay? And this material will stop the production of an amino acid chain. And so we know that all protein chains will start with methanin, and all protein chains will end with one of these three stop codons. And that's the beauty of transcription and translation. So where does it occur? I already talked about this. It occurs in the ribosome. Okay. The ribosomes are the sites of protein synthesis. Okay. And I just want to make sure that you understand, DNA, DNA is not making proteins. RNA is not making proteins. They're not making amino acids. All DNA and RNA do is code for proteins. It allows for the ribosome, the protein factory, to lay down the correct amino acids in the correct order. Your body builds amino acids based on <clears throat> biochemical pathways, linking amino groups together, R groups together, etc. will make an amino acid, one of the 20 amino acids. And it happens in a biochemical pathway, a bunch of proteins linked together, forming an amino acid. Okay. What Transcription translation does is take the DNA code, translate it into RNA, and then give that blueprint to form a certain protein. <coughs> Excuse me. So, no matter what, when we were talking about the universal codon process, same amino acids, the same amino acids build us, as the same amino acids build the bacteria that's in our mouth, on our hands, okay? Same amino acids build the elephant, build the tree that we're looking at. Same amino acids, all of those. The only difference is how you order the amino acids. What order do those amino acids come in? That changes the protein, that changes the structure, that changes the color, that's, that changes everything that we can physically and measure, you know, measure in, in life. That's what changes it. It's not that you have different amino acids or anything like that. It's the order at which they come. Okay? That's dictated by your DNA. Now, that DNA is coded for, changed into messenger RNA. That messenger RNA has to bind in a ribosome. And it binds in a ribosome on the small subunit of a ribosome will have what we call ribosomal RNA. And it's this little sequence of ribosomal RNA that allows for the messenger RNA to bind to it and sit on it. And then <clears throat> the large subunit will attach to the small subunit and it provides sites for what we call transfer RNA to come in and transfer amino acids in their correct order. Okay? We'll come back and talk about that in a little bit. Okay? But again, all ribosomes, this is the other unique piece about ribosomes, and this is why if you're a living organism, you must have a couple things, DNA or RNA and ribosomes. You have to have that. Okay? because ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis and we don't know any organism that exists today okay, and is considered alive that does not have ribosomes and RNA or DNA. So those ribosomes are going to be the site where the proteins are formed. They're going to have their own RNA. The cool thing about this is we can examine the ribosomal RNA and we can figure out connectiveness. How long have eukaryotes been separated from prokaryotes? Which came first, bacteria or archaea? Okay. And so we can examine their ribosomal RNA because everything on the planet, all one and a half million species on the planet have ribosomal RNA. So we can look at their ribosomal RNA and we can see how long it's, uh, you know, uh, how many deviations, how many mutations has there been since those two um, groups had a common ancestor. 
Okay? So it gives us that unique piece, but it's also highly valuable and extremely important for the binding of messenger RNA to the small subunit. It provides a binding spot. Okay? And it, that's why all genes begin with a start codon because they all begin with the same ribosomal RNA sequence and the same messenger RNA sequence to bind together. And then a start codon will lay down methanin and the protein can persist and the amino acid chain can persist. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with that being said, when we come back, I'm going to talk and dive into translation. It's a lot more complex than transcription. But nonetheless, the two go hand in hand, are extremely important for the production of proteins, and all organisms do these methods. Okay, so next time, translation.